In turning from the domestic to the foreign affairs of Mexico, we must be aware of carrying prejudice with us. Our minds must be open to all the facts and see them exactly as they were. But it is right and even necessary for our guidance in interpreting these facts to presume that aliens, traditionally disliked by the Mexicans, were treated no more kindly, fairly, and honestly than fellow citizens. And the evidence is conclusive that even the highest authorities were generally unbusinesslike, often unjust or tricky, and on too many occasions positively dishonorable in their dealings with foreigners. Our first minister to Mexico, received there on June 1st, 1825, was Joel R. Poinsett. Apparently, a better man for the office could not have been chosen or even created, and the warm interest of the United States in the cause of Spanish-American independence are prompt recognition of Mexico, and the fact that her political institutions have been modeled upon ours were additional auguries for the success of his mission. But duty required him to stand for a Protestant power in a country intensely Roman Catholic, to represent democracy where the dominant element consisted of aristocrats hoping more or less generally for a Bourbon king to support Monroe's doctrine of America for the Americans against the strength of Europe and the European affiliations of Mexico, to vindicate the equal position of the United States where Great Britain had established a virtual protectorate, to insist upon full commercial privileges when the Spanish-American states favor mutual concessions and to antagonize other influences possessing no little strength. His only feasible course was to affiliate with men of the popular Democratic Federalist Party. Largely through his advice, they abandoned their plan of rebelling, placed their confidence in organization and the ballot, and so gained the ascendancy. They soon fell into excesses of their own, however, which they were glad to charge against a Protestant and foreigner. All the other elements antagonized by him joined in the accusations. Envy of the recognized prosperity of the United States assisted, and in the end he came to be almost universally denounced by the Mexicans as the diabolical agent of a jealous, hypocritical, designing government. Of course, the Poinsett affair planted a root of bitterness in the United States. Our national authorities could but protest against the attacks upon our minister that were made by state legislatures in contempt of all diplomatic usage, against the neglect of the Mexican executive to shield him, and against the general attitude of distrust and ill will exhibited by that country. Indeed, our government fully believed that baseless popular clamor had been permitted to exert a sinister influence against the Americans in its councils and pointedly informed Guerrero that unless a marked change in the temper of his administration should speedily occur, a collision might result. And of course, the people of the United States could not fail to notice the abusive and even ferocious treatment accorded to our representative, against whom no charges were made by the Mexican government, and to resent still more keenly the insults that were lavished upon the character and purposes of the American nation. The fact that Poinsett continued to be an important factor in our public life, even becoming a member of the cabinet at a later day, tended to emphasize these feelings, both official and popular. Besides all this, official work of his added to the irritation in both countries. As one of his principal duties, he was instructed to make a treaty reaffirming the boundary agreed upon with Spain in 1819, or if he could, by a portion at least of Texas. The proposal that our neighbor should sell us territory has been called by partisan writers in the United States insulting, but as we have made purchases from Spain, France, Russia, and Mexico herself, this accusation is evidently unwarranted. On the other hand, the suggestion was reasonable. We, for our part, desired the land, aside from its intrinsic value as a needed protection to New Orleans and the Mississippi, and Mexico not only appeared to misprize it, but could have strengthened herself somewhat by letting it go. Later it became a fashion with her public men to declaim about its preciousness and beauty. But as late as 1836, according to Santa Ana himself, many officials did not know where Texas was or what nation claimed it. Mexico had ten times the area she could people, and what she needed in that quarter was the means of shielding her northern settlements from the Indians. Moreover, under contracts already made, Texas was filling up with men who, as President Victoria saw in 1825, were not at all likely to assimilate with the Mexicans, and since it was recognized that a mistake had been made in admitting such colonists, it might well have seemed the part of wisdom to cut off the infected section before it should set an example of dissatisfaction, and perhaps cause trouble also with the United States. 
Poinsett. Accordingly, taking the matter up in July 1825, stated frankly that the Treaty of 1819 was recognized by his country as binding, but expressed a desire to lay it aside and fix upon a more satisfactory line. This pleased Victoria and Alamon, for they imagined they could push the boundary eastward almost to the Mississippi, but in spite of Poinsett's urgency and his dropping the plan to extend our territory, a long delay followed. At last, however, on January 12, 1828, a Treaty of Limits reaffirming the agreement with Spain was duly signed. In the course of April, it reached Washington and was ratified. On the last day of the month, our Secretary of State notified the Mexican representative that he was ready to exchange ratifications and reminded him that under the terms of the instrument, this would have to be done by May 12. But Obregón was not prepared to act, and for that reason the treaty failed. Yet the Mexicans not only held that the United States caused the miscarriage in order to prosecute designs upon Texas, but charged officially as well as on the street. With neither evidence nor plausibility in favor of the accusation that our minister stole the paper entrusted to him on May 10th for transmission, which would have authorized Obregón to exchange the ratifications. So we had, in 1830, this extraordinary picture. On the one hand, the United States earnestly desiring the prosperity and friendship of Mexico and pursuing a just and sympathetic policy towards her, and on the other, Mexico accusing us of hostile intentions and the basest arts. From that day on, everything we did was viewed with a jaundiced eye. The Treaty of Limits was, however, revived by fresh negotiations and in April 1832 went into effect. By its terms, a joint commission to run the line had to be appointed within a year from this date, and presently Mexico received notice, both at her own capital and at ours, that an American commissioner had been named, but she paid no attention to the matter and the year expired. Our minister was then directed to negotiate a new agreement, labored for more than 12 months, and finally, by addressing strong language personally to the acting president, carried the point. Yet the United States was officially denounced for endeavoring and by wretched artifices to delay the fixing of the boundary. Meanwhile, a treaty of amity and commerce proposed by Poinsett at about the same time as the Treaty of Limits, had been pursuing a checkered career, though a similar agreement between Mexico and England went rapidly through. At one stage of the proceedings, the Mexican plenipotentiaries kept our minister entirely in the dark about an important concession made to Great Britain, falsely assuring him that equally favorable terms were offered to this country. Indeed, Victoria showed a strong disposition to block the business altogether. July 10, 1826, however, the negotiators reached an agreement, but it did not prove satisfactory to the American Senate. A second treaty, signed on February 1828, did not please the Congress of Mexico and was properly rejected. At a later date, negotiations were again resumed, but in 1831 that body held the matter in abeyance for more than nine months. At last, one day before the session was to close, our minister gave notice that unless the treaty were concluded, he would leave the country. The government at Washington also exerted some pressure by insisting that the two matters should fare alike, and postponing the re-ratification of the Treaty of Limits, and consequently both treaties became law at the same time, April 5, 1832. Yet for nearly a year, the commercial treaty was not promulgated by Mexico, and hence, though her citizens residing in the United States could have the benefit of it, Americans in Mexico could not, for the local authorities with whom it was necessary to deal declared they had no knowledge of such an agreement. Towards the close of 1829, Guerrero, as a desperate throw for popularity, asked for the recall of Poinsett, merely saying that public opinion demanded it. And then for about six years, the United States had as its representative a friend of Jackson's named Anthony Butler, whose only qualifications for the post were an acquaintance with Texas and a strong desire to see the United States obtain it. In brief, he was a national disgrace. Besides having been through bankruptcy more than once, if we may believe the Mexican minister of Washington and having a financial interest in the acquisition of this Mexican territory, he was personally a bully and a swashbuckler, ignorant at first of the Spanish language and even the forms of diplomacy, shamefully careless about legation affairs, wholly unprincipled as to methods and by the testimony of two American consuls, openly scandalous in his conduct. One virtue, to be sure, according to his own account, he possessed. He never drank spirits, but one learns of this with regret, for an overdose of alcohol would sometimes be a welcome excuse for him. His particular business was to obtain as much of Texas as possible, an enterprise that lay close to Jackson's heart, and he began by visiting the province, about whose loyalty and relations with the United States much concern was already felt at Mexico, when on the way to his post, 
this promise of indiscretion in office was admirably fulfilled. Maintaining a hold on our president by positive assurances of success, he loafed, schemed, made overtures, threatened, and was ignored, rebuffed, snubbed, and cajoled, fancied he could outplay or buy the astute and hostile Aleman, tried to do underworking with Pedrasa, plotted bribery with Juan Hernandez, the confessor of Santa Ana's sister, grossly violated his conciliatory instructions by engaging in a truculent personal affair with Tornell, and was finally, after ceasing to represent us ordered out of the country. In short, he succeeded only in proving that we had for a minister a cantankerous, incompetent rascal, in making it appear that our government was eager to obtain Mexican territory, and in suggesting, though explicitly, and repeatedly ordered to eschew all equivocal methods that we felt no scruples as to means. On the ground of Butler's connection with disaffected Texas, Mexico politely asked for his recall near the close of 1835, and in December, Powhatan Ellis, born a Virginian but now a federal judge in Mississippi, was appointed charge d'affaires. A few months later, Texas broke away from the mother country, and her former lords felt sure that from beginning to end, in the colonization, rebellion, and successful defense of that region, the hand of the American government could plainly enough be seen. Their state of feeling seemed to Butler a perfect tempest of passion, and Ellis believed that the cabinet of Mexico discussed seriously the question of an open rupture with the United States. The Mexican view, however, although supported by a section of the American public, was radically incorrect. Essentially, the migration of our citizens across the Sabine formed a part of the great movement that peopled the Mississippi Valley. The causes of the Texan Rebellion were provided by Mexico herself. That step actually crossed the wish and aims of our administration, which desired to buy the province, not see it become an independent country. From the very first, our national authorities proclaimed and endeavored to enforce neutrality, and they gave the Texans no assistance in their struggle for independence. The British minister at Mexico expressed the opinion to Santa Ana that our government had done all that could be expected, and all that lay in its power. And Santa Ana did not venture to deny this. Individual Americans, and sometimes Americans in groups did, it is true, contribute materially to aid the cause of Texas, but in most cases their action was entirely lawful, while in the others it could not be prevented. Moreover, these few trespasses against the law of neutrality were in substance only just retribution for the tyranny, misgovernment, and atrocities of Mexico. In reality, therefore, our skirts were as clear as reasonably could have been expected.